want to welcome you to the New York Stock Exchange. So, so one of the reasons why this place is so special for me is because just over 20 years ago, I was in this room as well, except for I was sitting where you were sitting because I was the intern. So I just want to reflect for a minute before I get started on how, how I got from where you're sitting to where I'm standing here today and, and the lessons that I learned throughout that process. So I, I think um, an important thing to just understand about me is I'm not that person that had a career path mapped out in high school or college. You know, I, I didn't have this grand vision of, of where I was going to go. And in fact, as a freshman or sophomore engineering school student, I never would have guessed that I would have interned on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And then as an intern on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, you know, I, 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 it just took one day, one day to change my career path. The moment I walked into that building and onto the floor, I just knew that it was the place that, that I belonged at that time. So I went back and I finished my degree. And then when I, you know, I finished school and I came back to New York and I worked on the floor as a trading assistant, uh, which is a clerk um, at a specialist firm. And I went on, went on to become a specialist. Uh, and then in my early years as a specialist, I never would have guessed that I would walk away from the trading floor 10 years later. I mean, after all, it's this place that, that felt like home to me when I first entered it. It seemed so strange that I, that I would leave. Uh, and it never would have occurred to me that I would leave to take a break to go to culinary school. Uh, it also wouldn't have occurred to me that I would have come back to the industry. Uh, and it would have been unfathomable that when I came back to the, to the industry, I was working for NASDAQ. So definitely didn't see that coming. And then when I was at NASDAQ, it never would have occurred to me, I, I never would have guessed, that I would not only come back to the New York Stock Exchange, but become its COO. So now that I've established that I certainly did not have a five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan out there, uh, here I am, 20 years later, standing in front of you uh, as CEO of, of the New York Stock Exchange. And, and one of the things that, that I think does lead to my success uh, in my career was, was not so much about the planning, but it was about how I, approached, how I approached my decisions each day. And I think that there is one primary driver uh, to, to how I've progressed through my career. And that's that every decision I made, virtually every, any given day, was always made with, with the goal of choosing what was right for the business uh, and choosing what was right for the organization. And in many cases, it, it may have been right for me personally, but not always. And, and I think that that's an important distinction because it wasn't about me, it was about the organization. The dirty little secret is that I think if you make decisions that way, they tend to work out for you personally as well. I and mean, people want to hire the person that's going to do the right thing for, for the business and for the organization. So that did work out for me, but, but it, wasn't about, it wasn't about me. And that's a lesson that I learned very early on the trading floor, is that it's not about you. And you don't take it personally. You know, you, you, you're, you're working towards a goal. And there are a lot of lessons that you learn on a trading floor. But I think if I had to pick one piece of advice as you're managing your own careers, uh, make sure you have the right goal. Because if you have the right goal, I think everything else will just fall into place for you. A few weeks ago, I left my phone in the back of an Uber. And it should not have been a traumatic experience, but it was. It was very traumatic. It was far more traumatic than it should have been and far more than I would have expected it to be. But I've become dependent on my iPhone. And I think that, that we as, as a society and certainly as an industry have become dependent on technology. And that's, that's all fine and, and good until it doesn't work or it's taken away from us. And then the question is, how do we react and how do we respond then? Technology brings us a lot of benefits. It, it allows us to be more effective. It brings us scale. We can do far more with it than we're able to do without it. But the question is, you know, what happens when, it, when it's gone? And, and I think that that's when we as people need to be ready for that, that aspect of it as well. It, it's had a significant impact on the evolution of our markets. When we look at the, the U.S. equity market structure, you know, technology was, was first introduced, and, and it was largely uh, originally automating functions that, that were pr traditionally done by humans and performed by humans, and there was, now you had a mix of, of, of both of those things. Then there were regulations that, that were in, introduced in, in the equity markets, and that led us to, to using technology to, to work towards those, too. So we would, you know, regulation M NMS came in, and that, that told us that we had, to, we had to trade at the best prices, regardless of where those were. Uh, and so with Reg NMS, we developed, we used technology to, to solve for some of the requirements there and to meet, to meet our, um, our obligations the, around the rules. We also then saw that because those rules were in place, there was more market fragmentation. So there were more places to trade. So we used technology to, to manage that, that fragmentation. 
as we started to, to trade on more places and trade in more venues, there became you know, different types of things that came up. And so now, all of a sudden, there were new fee structures in, in place because participants were trying to get, or market centers were trying to attract more liquidity to their own markets. So they put in interesting you know, rebate and, and fee models. So now we introduced order types to help us manage not only trading across multiple venues and algorithms to trade across multiple venues, but now we're going to introduce new order types so that we can manage our economics. So what are, what are our fees going to be? And we'll, we'll have some certainty around what the cost is for us to trade. And so we continue to introduce more and more technology uh, as we're trying to you know, work through the evolution of the markets. And then, and then you see that with all, all uh, the economic model changing, then broker-dealers are looking at, well, hey, how, how, can I, how can I end up managing my own economics? So there were dark pools were introduced, and, and then there's more order types and more venues and more pricing models, and you just see the complexity that, that is introduced into the markets. So I think that that's you know, just an important thing to understand is that we use technology to solve problems. When we do that, we're often introducing new challenges, which we then use technology to solve for those as well. And it just leads to a more complex system. I don't mean to make it sound as if it's all bad. It's, it, it's good. The markets are great. Using the technology that we have today, market makers are able to, to compete more effectively because they're able to manage their risk more effectively. So, so using some of the, the more sophisticated technology, they can determine you know, how, how much exposure they have and hedge their risk not only across different market centers but across asset classes. And that's, you know, that's a really good thing. And the reason why is they're able to make better markets so that you and me as retail investors, when we want to go buy something or sell something, we're able to do it for $10 a trade or less than that and, and in less than a second. And the reason why they're able to make better markets is because they have technology so that they have visibility, immediate visibility into their risk. And that's, that's really very important to them. And, and they can you know, hedge their risk all, all in fractions of a second. And if, and if you just want to think about the scale that we're talking about, it takes 300 milliseconds to blink your eye. But in less than 10 milliseconds, using some of the, the, the latest uh, tools that are out there, you can send a message from Chicago to New York and back to Chicago in less than 10 milliseconds. So 300 milliseconds to blink your eye and less than 10 milliseconds to send an order you know, across the country that way. So it seems a little crazy if you think about it, if you let it sink in. And, and the question is really why? Why the arms race? Why do we need that? But we're able to have tighter markets then. Instead of having a specialist, which was my old gig on the trading floor, just being the single market maker, uh, which you know, making markets and setting, the, setting prices, there are now market makers competing for those prices. So they're competing to have the best markets out there. And that technology allows them to do that. But I think that when you look at those spreads being tighter, that that's a positive thing for the market. But you saw how we got to a much more complex system. And that, that's where I think we need to have people aware of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're going to react when things go wrong. And I, you, know, you, you look at... Um, a single mistake when I first started my career on the trading floor. If somebody, if somebody made a mistake, it usually was limited to a single order uh, or single trade. Now, if there's a mistake, it can have implications across the entire markets and potentially across asset classes. If you look at, at the, the flash crash of 2012, one mistake, and it had significant repercussions. And, you know, I, I think it's just very, very important that we understand that with that scale, and with all of the benefits that we get from technology, they don't come for free. They come with risks. And we need to be prepared as people for dealing with those risks. So, you know, last week uh, at the New York Stock Exchange, you know, we, we had an issue. And when we identified the issue, we had an issue with our technology. When we identified the issue, we suspended trading. And we were able to limit the risk to the market by making that decision. And... You know, coming out of that, because those decisions were made as people, we ended up having minimal impact to clients. Uh, New York Stock Exchange listed companies continued to trade all day, and that's because we were, you know, prepared for for how we were going to uh, handle those decisions and let people making the, you know, have people making the right decisions there. And I think that when you look at um, the fact that technology mistakes are going to happen, because behind the scenes, it's people that are that are coding and 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 building these things, and people make mistakes. So it's going to be how we prepare for it as an industry. And I think that's the phase of, of evolution that the industry is in right now, is how do we prepare for 
systems issues. So the SEC has encouraged us a little bit with, with something called Reg SCI, which will be uh, coming out in November, but it focuses just on that. What kind of guardrails do we put in place? What kind of systems, uh, you know, uh, redundancy do we have and resiliency do we have? And that, that's where, where we're spending a lot of time and energy now is making sure that when issues do happen, they don't impact uh, to, to a large extent, um, you know, just, just because we were ready for them. So, you know, that it's, it's one area that, that we're very focused. And, and another thing that, that we believe here at the New York Stock Exchange is that the human element is, is very important. In fact, we're the only U.S. equity market that combines advanced technology with human traders. And that's, I think, a real differentiator for us because we, we see the value in the people as part of the process every day. And you look at what is now the designated market maker and, and what used to be the specialist, they're, they're, also, they're responsible for ensuring fair and orderly markets each day. They're also overseeing and participating in uh, our opening auctions and our closing auctions, which tend to be the largest liquidity events throughout the day. And, you know, you can make the argument that, hey, there are other markets without people, but one of, one of the often used analogies uh, it, it, here is, is the airline pilot, right? It, it's, you look at a plane, a plane can take itself, you know, take off, it can fly itself throughout the day, but there's value in having somebody behind the controls, and, and I certainly wouldn't want to get on a plane without a pilot just yet. So, so there's, there's that extra value and that extra safety there. Uh, and, and I think that there's, there's an, you know, that's an important piece to us. So when we look at the human element, we also look at uh, one of the other things I was talking about was complexity and limiting complexity. So we operate five venues. We operate three equity markets and two options exchanges. Uh, one of the first things that we thought is, like, do the markets need to be so complex? We understand how we got here. And, you know, we, we can, it's very logical how it progressed. But, but we, we want to make sure that we're not in, introducing a complex a complex environment when it doesn't need to be that way. So we, we started with an assessment of, of ourselves. We looked at our systems and we said, what do we have that, that isn't necessary anymore? So we did a review of all the different order types that have been developed over the years, and we eliminated a number of them. Uh, we, we also took, took a look at, at, at how our exchanges differed from each other. And we, you know, like I mentioned, we have five different venues. We have different technology running those five different venues. So now we're looking at um, harmonizing all of those platforms onto a single technology system, which re just reduces the complexity of the system. You now have one set of people coding and updating a single technology. It's easier for our clients because they're able to code and update to a, to a single technology. Uh, and there's just less, there are fewer places for things to go wrong. Uh, so that, that's, that's an uh, initiative that we spent the, the better part of last year or all of last year on. And we're looking to first roll out our first market on the new technology later this summer. Uh, and, and I think that that's going to have a, a significant benefit for us. So it, it was very important for us to look and see, you know, how can, how can we keep it, keep it simple when it's possible? So just, you know, to summarize, I would say that embrace technology, but don't underestimate the value or the role of people in the process. Keep it simple when you can. And don't be offended by this, but it's not about you. Thank you. Thank you.